So all of this discussion about the OGL over the last few days has got me just digging into all sorts of different things, reading up on all of these different systems and games that have been published using the open game license and how this could affect globally the entire tabletop world, basically, that has existed and has been built up since the late 90s, early 2000s. And in the course of all of this, I guess on the 5th of January, um, Ryan Dancy who was the former VP of Wizards of the Coast and the architect of the original game license, open game license, made a statement over on enworld.org uh, when asked his opinion about the current plan by Wizards of the Coast to deauthorize the current uh, open game license, which is 1.0a, in favor of a new one, he responded as follows. He says, My public opinion is that Hasbro does not have the power to deauthorize a version of of the OGL. If that had been a power that we wanted to reserve for, for Hasbro, we would have enumerated it in the license. I am on record numerous places in emails and blogs and interviewers, interviews saying that the license could never be revoked. Um, he also it mentions here uh, maintains the Open Gaming Foundation and has been noted previously. Even Wizards of the Coast in its own OGL fact did not believe at the time that the license could be revoked. And they said this here um, under Section 7. Um, yes, it could, or under Part 7, I should say. Uh, the license already defines what will happen to content that has been previously distributed used in an earlier version in Section 9. As a result, even if Wizards made a change you disagreed with, you could continue to use an open, uh, use an earlier acceptable version at your option. In other words, there's no reason for Wizards to ever make a change that the community of people using the open gaming license would object to because the community would just ignore the change anyway. Um, and then they have the whole, you know, you can scroll down and read this. But there's also, and I found this yesterday because someone linked it to my um, to my video. Um, it says, what is meant by the term open game license? And this is something that was written back in February 9th of 2001. You can go back in the Wayback Machine to pull this up. It says, what is meant by the term open gaming? And this layout is really funky, so I apologize for that, but I'll pull that over real quick. Um, it says, uh, an open game is a game that can be freely copied, modified, and distributed, and a system for ensuring that material once distributed as an open game will remain permanently open. And this is from the original um, Wizards.com D20 system um, when they were talking about bringing the open game license into play. Um, and this is, I believe, maintained or written by Ryan Dancy at the time. So, I mean, this is just further proof that the original intent of the open game license was to create an open system that was permanent. And I realize that a lot of people are focusing on the fact that the open game license doesn't have the language irrevocable within it. They say that it only has the terminology that is as perpetual. Well, and this is, again, this goes back to what will be determined in a court of law when and if Wizards of the Coast decides to start pursuing all of these third-party content creators for you know, infringement or whatever, um, unless they're walking things back, which who knows, you know, the, the, the biggest rumor I've heard right now, which I think is interesting, is they did this purposefully um, because what they wanted to do was get a reaction out of people and then be able to walk it back and say, well, okay, yeah, you're right, guys. We were too strict. We're going to walk it back now. You win and get everybody on their side again. Um, they did this as a publicity stunt. That could be true, but I think that it just comes down to personally, I think Hasbro really is pushing Wizards of the Coast to milk every last little drop of profitability for things. And they're looking at all of the language and saying, you know what, over the last 20 years, and this is something that, like, I've got another article um, that I'm going to be doing, another video I'm going to be doing, because I've been looking into all of these alternatives to Dungeons & Dragons, right, for my own personal enjoyment. Because, you know, I haven't ever really explored stuff outside of, like, D&D &D and Homebrew. Like, Forgotten Realms, Dragonlance, the two worlds I played a lot in. Um, not a lot of Greyhawk, but... Dragonlance, Forgotten Realms, Forgotten Realms in particular, but I've done a lot of my own homebrew, but we're always using that D20 system. So that got me looking into, I've never tried Pathfinder, I've never tried this, that, or the other. I did try the Star Wars in like the late, mid to late 90s, there was a Star Wars game out there that used like D6s, um, but mostly I've, I've always ever used like the D20 systems, and... When I started looking into this article, uh, I need to recenter that, so I apologize. When I started looking into this article on alternatives to Dungeons & Dragons, I started looking at all of these games, and I'm like, holy crap, like, almost everything in here is 
a open game licensed product like Pathfinder, Starfinder, Star Wars the role playing game, you know, all of these games, not all of them, but a, a lot of the games that are considered alternatives to D&D are literally games that spun up around the OGL from 3.5 edition and then into the modern area into uh, the OGL 1.01 1.0a which is under the 5th edition. So it really got me thinking about the fact that everybody could be affected but like I would say I, I I'm quoting numbers out of my ass at this point, but I could argue I would argue that 80 percent, 85 percent of the tabletop games that have spun up in the last 20 years are all based around some version of the open game license. And so Wizards trying to go back, I think, is you've got Hasbro looking at all of these franchises that have spun up around the open game license and going, we've got to find a way. Because we're suffering. This is another thing. I've got another video coming about later. Um, apparently, they've canceled five of their in-development uh, video games based on the D&D um, franchise because they lost. They had a 40% loss in sales last year in 2022 for video games. And so they're really tightening their fist on anything tabletop because they need to make those profits back. And I think they're looking at this going, Pathfinder, that's a multi-million dollar franchise. Uh, you know, all of these other, you know, you've got... Uh, you know, Ouroboros or whatever it's called that Chris Metzen spun up last year on his Kickstarter. You've got the Dungeon Dudes, DM Dave. You get all these guys who are out there making hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars using this license that was originally meant to be, as it says here, um, any thing that is distributed as an open game will remain permanently open. And you got Ryan Dancy saying, my opinion is that Hasbro doesn't have the power to deauthorize a previous version of the OGL. Um, it just looks like the lawyers have gone through everything with a fine tooth comb and they're trying to find any way that they can use the language to their advantage to say, hey, yeah, guys, sorry, we're taking it all back. Like you now all owe us money. And if you don't, you're going to have to discontinue your products or we're going to sue you into oblivion. And it just feels like a greedy corporation doing things that greedy corporations do. Um, I had a very good conversation with my wife last night. We were walking on our evening walk, and she's not – she got into uh, fifth edition and tabletop for the first time in her life because of what we're working on with this project and with the with the Weave in the Void stuff. But she had never played any of the previous D&D versions before, and she got into fifth edition, and she's passingly familiar with what's going on with the OGL because we were building something using – 1.0 a under the fifth edition and so she's at least familiar with that component of it but when we were talking about it last night she's like well what's going to happen to companies like pathfinder as an example um paizo um and 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 Sandra gaming reached out to me the other day really cool guy you should check out his channel if you haven't already done so um and he was like hey you want to you want to talk about this in a video and i was like hell yeah i want to talk about this in a video because i think it's a great conversation to be had because there is a greater impact that I think these proposed changes are going to have on companies that have built up these massive fan bases over the years. And it's a lot of different intellectual properties. Someone uh, posted the, uh, uh, this morning, I saw a post saying that like Knights of the Old Republic, as an example, the entire Knights of the Republic video games are based off of the SRT. <laughs> like, like, oh my God, like, you know, that system has been used in so many places and if it's true that wizards of the coast and hasbro are trying to revoke the previous versions of the ogl that is just nefarious beyond all levels of nefarious but also i think and again this is going to come down to arguing in court um like um like he's saying here uh, like nancy is saying um, the license, as he's said in numerous places in blogs and interviews, the license could never be revoked. He says Hasbro does not have the power to deauthorize a version of the OGL, and that's his public opinion. Again, public opinion. A lot of people go, yeah, but courts, lawyers, everything else. Here's the thing. Interpret uh, uh, the law. What is it? What is that saying? Interpretation is nine tenths of the law. Sorry, my brain is stumbling because I haven't had breakfast yet. Interpretation is nine tenths of the law. So it doesn't really matter what the lawyers say. It matters what was interpreted. And if people interpreted that the open gaming license was open forever because they said, going back to the Wayback Machine, that it was meant to be a permanently open system, right? 
then that's something that the court will look at in a case and say, okay, the interpretation of that is what's the most important thing. It doesn't matter the specifics of the language. It matters what the interpretation was. It does the average layman who doesn't understand legal speak. When he reads this terminology, does he understand that this is something that could be revoked or does he think that this is something that can go on forever in perpetuity because you said it was permanent way back in 2001? This is all stuff that if they keep going down the current path they're going. I've already seen mention of a class action lawsuit that I don't know how legit it is, but there is supposedly a lawyer who has issued a class action lawsuit advance warning to Wizards of the Coast, letting them know that if they're going down this previous path, letting them know that if they go down this path, that it could lead to a class action lawsuit. I don't know how legit that is. I'd have to dig into that more, but I've heard rumors and and other stuff. In any case, um, I think it's very interesting that you have the original architect of the open game license, the former VP of... Wizards of the Coast, Ryan Dancy out there saying, in his opinion, and this is the guy who was the architect and kind of wrote all this stuff, it can't be revoked. That's that's food for thought right there. And for me, it's an interesting conversation to have as I continue to dig into things um, here around this because it is an interesting controversy because I love tabletop and I do a lot of stuff with the tabletop world. And um, I'm literally sitting here this morning, and the reason I got onto this article was because I was researching, as I said, I pulled up this article on all these alternatives, and and I'm looking at what are some fun things I could dive into this year now that I definitely know that I want to move away from, you know, the uh, Wizards of the Coast and D&D stuff. What are some other systems that I've never tried? Like, honestly, Starfinder sounds super interesting to me. Pathfinder, I've played some of the, like, the Owlbear games. I love the Pathfinder um I forget the name of the first one, but the second one was Wrath of the Righteous. What's the first one called? Kingmaker? Maybe Pathfinder Kingmaker? But the Owlbear games, Owlcat games, sorry, um, they've done a great job with those Pathfinder games. But I've never actually done the tabletop version of Pathfinder. The MMORPG was crap. I tried that. It was absolute crap, and it, it eventually fell apart anyway. But I'm interested in that. I'm also hugely interested in um, Warhammer, because I've never done Warhammer before, and Alcat Games has a Rogue Trader coming out later this year. I'm, I'm starting to realize that maybe I should get into Warhammer. Um, and, and there's all these other systems that I've never played before and these other worlds that I've never explored. But then when I started digging into things, I'm like, God, everything seems to be tied to the OGL. And I don't realize it's not everything, but a lot of it does. And it just got me thinking about how much this could impact if Hasbro and Wizards really are going to go down this nuclear path. I don't know. Love to hear your thoughts, comments below. Drop a like if you like this video. Subscribe. Hit that bell icon. Support with a super thanks if you can. Or join as a member. Don't forget our Patreon page for our own world and our fantasy series. There's a Discord channel as well. See everybody in the next episode as we continue our discussion around this craziness that is the OGL 1.1.